All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. <laughs> It's interesting, actually, I was looking over the syllabus for the rest of the semester, and by the way, I reposted, for those of you who may have missed it, I reposted a schedule for everything that's due for a lecture, not for lab, but everything that's due for a lecture in Sakai in today's folder for the month of March. So if you want to go in there, if you have any questions about, like, you know, when do I have to do a problem set or anything like that, it is there. It's all fully organized and laid out for you for the entire month of March, especially given we have that big gap in there. I don't want anybody to forget anything. Might be a good idea to like print it out and stick it up on like your, your desk at home or something like that, since we are going to have a long gap. I'll go ahead and keep emailing, as you guys mentioned last week, I'll go ahead and keep emailing you guys a to-do list for the week. But your to-do list for this coming Friday and the following Friday will be very short. <laughs> um, we voted in class on Monday about test two. I went and checked the numbers even after I got back, and again, it was 58% uh, versus 42% uh, voted in favor of 20 questions, so that will be the, the length for test two. Um, just to emphasize some of the things that are coming up after that too, the problem set for molecular evolution, which is out there right now, is not due until Monday, March 25th. So you have, you know, on the order of about three weeks to finish this problem set. This is one of the rare times, I'm very rarely going to ever say this, this is one of the rare times I actually encourage you to do it later rather than sooner. The reason being is that's going to be much closer to the test date. If you do it right now and then you basically don't look at the material for three weeks and then have the test, not a good plan. <laughs> You're better off like doing some of the material closer to the test so it's fresh in mind. Or if you've already done it, you know, just look it over again or something like that. So on March 25th, we'll actually have a lecture with new material. However, that material will not be on test two. Okay? It'll be just like what we did with that first pop gen. On March 27th, we'll have a Q&A session again for test two. So if you have any questions from the material, you have, again, three weeks to look over the material and see what may be unclear. Test two material starts with Hardy Weinberg, and it goes all the way to the, uh, today's lecture. And finally, we have uh, test two itself on Friday, March 29th. Yep. And again, if for those of you, if you have any special accommodations needed, please let Julie Noor know before March 27th. Otherwise, we may not be able to accommodate you after that. So, without further ado, let's go into today's material. As usual, I appreciate your responses from the pre-class quiz. Uh, actually, surprisingly, not many people said that things were confusing, or, or a few people did, but weren't especially specific about it. But one thing that came up a lot was along the lines of this. How does background selection reduce variation if it's only eliminating one individual's alleles? That's actually kind of counterintuitive. And I have, I have to rem admit, I remember when I first heard about background selection, this was uh, something that bugged me as well. So I'll go into that in a little bit of detail, and I'll recap a couple of points about the relationship between selective sweeps and background selection, because there were a few questions sort of alluding to that. A lot of people identified areas of interest. Muller's ratchet was one a lot of people said they were interested in, benefits of sexual reproduction in general. A lot of people liked the debate between uh, the, the sweeps and background selection. One person actually pointed it out in there, and this is actually true, that if you look at this, this is basically the modern neutralist selectionist debate. The neutralists are kind of the background selection people, and the selectionists are kind of the sweet people. That's sort of the modern version of the neutralist selectionist debate. And then the last part is a lot of people said it was really cool that you can actually pinpoint genes under positive selection using pot. I completely agree. Um, the other thing, I forgot to mention this too, in terms of the sweeps and background selection, it was very interesting reading your different responses, because a few people put in there like, well, it doesn't sound like much of a debate, because obviously sweeps is going to do a bigger effect. And a couple of other people put, well, obviously there's tons of, of bad mutations out there, so it seems like background selection is the biggest one. It's good. This classroom reflects the state of the field. <laughs> Short answer is we're still doing experiments to try to sort that out. In fact, literally right now, my lab is doing experiments trying to sort out this pair of questions right here. So with respect to background selection, again, what's going on? So I pulled this actually from the review paper that I linked you guys to in Sakai, if any of you are interested. This is published by Brian Charlesworth just in the latest issue of the Journal of Heredity. So this is the March-April 2013 issue. So this is one of the figures from that. The idea is, again, that as you have bad mutations, they essentially doom alleles at linked genes. Now, I say bad. I don't mean instantly lethal. I don't mean it's that bad. I mean that it reduces overall your, your, uh, your productivity. That rather than having on average two kids, you're going to have on average 1.7 kids. Again, average, not individuals having 1.7. Now what happens is what it does is it makes it so these bad alleles will eventually go away. So you can, if you look at this picture, here's 10 different sequences, and the red, the red dots there in the picture on the bottom indicate bad mutations. What's going to happen is if you have the absence of recombination, or you have low recombination, 
As this one right here is being eliminated, so look where I'm pointing, As this one right here is being eliminated, this, this, this other mutation, which is neutral, is also eliminated. Again, as this one's eliminated, this one's also eliminated. As that one's eliminated, those two over there are eliminated because they're stuck together. So in effect, so you, can, you start off with 10 different sequences, you end up with seven different sequences. This is analogous, not identical to, but analogous to reducing the population size at that gene. Okay? That as, basically, as you lose these, it's almost like there's fewer overall individuals contributing to much later generations. It's like there's fewer overall individuals uh, contributing to much later generations. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to, that's going to affect genes that, or, uh, genes that are totally linked. As you have more recombination, let's say, for example, let's say there's recombination between that red one and those two over there. If there's recombination there, then maybe as the red one's going down in frequency, it will recombine from those other two, and the other two will persist in the population. So if you have low recombination, these mutations will eliminate a lot of variation, just because there's so many of them, too. If you have high recombination, not so much. You just lose the bad mutation. Okay? Does that make sense? People reasonably okay with background selection? Any questions on background selection? Okay, on that note. <laughs> so looking at selective sweeps, and this is, I'm just, just recapping this to remind you what's going on. Uh, they're analogous, but what's happening there is rather than the elimination of variation, we're looking at the spread of variation. So let's look at, I made this picture, this is sort of a modification of the previous one, but in this case, for this example, write this down if you're taking notes, in this particular example, we're assuming the red, the red ones are, are adaptive, they're good, they're making you have more offspring. So if you have a region of low recombination, right, and you have this red new mutation over there that's good, it's going to spread, it's going to go to 100% eventually over time. As it's doing that, if you have no recombination, as this one spreads over here, this one also spreads, because it's glued to it, right? It's, it, it is that other one there, the, the black one next to it is hitchhiking. And eventually, over time, you'll go to a population that looks like this, right? So you've lost all variation. You've lost a lot of variation there because there's, there's an absence of recombination. In contrast, if you have higher recombination, again, this is exactly the same picture, there's your adaptive one. This one we still see hitchhiking along, right? Because it's very close. Even in a region of high recombination, you still get some hitchhiking, okay? But what's happening is as you go further away, some of these other guys over here persisted because they were able to recombine onto the spreading chromosome, okay? They were able to recombine onto that spreading chromosome. So that's why... In regions of high recombination, selective sweeps only let you lose some variation, whereas in regions of low recombination, you lose a lot of variation. Okay? And the place where you lose variation in regions of high recombination is mostly close to the good mutation. That mutt is from mutation. I just couldn't fit it there. Any questions on sweeps? Let's take a quick uh, hand poll. How many people are going to ask you to vote for which one you think is, is a bigger effect? So I'm just curious in the room. How many, uh, I'm going to ask for background selection versus sweeps, which has the bigger overall effect. How many people say background selection? Okay, how many people say sweeps? Ah, look at that, it's very evenly divided. <laughs> Great. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and start on the problems, and we'll go over the answers in a few minutes. Uh, TAs will be walking around, as will I. Thanks. Alrighty, let's go ahead and go over the answers for these. So, question one. Question one is dealing with Muller's ratchet. So the question here is, as abbreviated in the slide is, if an individual has a new bad mutation, presumably selection could prevent that mutation from becoming very common. Right? So we know that. You know, we've seen that in your allele A1 simulations. You have a new mutation. If it's bad, unless you invoke like really strong genetic drift, it's just going to go away. What have you learned earlier in the course that could explain why the accumulation of new bad mutations still happens in asexual populations despite selection against such mutations? Now, one misnomer people tend to think is that, oh, if you have an asexual population, there's no selection. That's absolutely not true. You still have selection with it. So why is it that you, can, why is it that you get this accumulation nonetheless? Does anybody have a thought on this? This was kind of a tough one. This was sort of a thought question on it. Why does you have the accumulation of these new bad mutations, even though you have selection against them individually? There's a little hint in the verbiage I just used. The crit yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's, so that's, that's exactly, that's an essential piece to it. That's not the full answer, but that's an essential piece to it. So the, the comment made was that if it doesn't reduce fitness uh, by enough to immediately kill the individual, it'll still reproduce, and you still have it sticking around. That's an essential piece, but what else is going on? Yeah? Exactly. So that's another piece to it. So another piece there, which is this is exactly right, that you know, it's, you're going to essentially reproduce the bad mutation over and over again. The odds of getting a reversion or, or getting the, a mutation back is extremely unlikely. The other piece, let me add, so both of those are absolutely essential pieces to it. The third piece to it is that it's not necessarily the same new bad mutations in every individual. And this is true like when we think about people in, the, in this room, right? And remember we all said that you all, just like I do, probably have some bad mutations relative to our parents. We don't all have the same bad mutations. We're not related to each other. We all have new bad mutations, but they're not all the same ones. So overall, fitness is being reduced, but it's not necessarily in the same way. So let's say, for example, you know, let's say that this gentleman right here has one bad mutation. I have a bad mutation. Julie has a bad mutation. Everybody's getting this bad mutation. The next generation, everybody, again, gets more bad mutations, but it's not the same mutations. So even though selection is acting to get rid of you know, you know, the one in me and the one in him, the one in her, it's still like there's just this constant accumulation and there's different ones in every individual arising. And that's what makes it so it's bad for the overall population of asexual individuals. It's not like they all have the same bad mutation and it's at high frequency. There's just this abundance of low frequency bad mutations among everybody. So that's the, tricky, that's the critical piece to that. On the second one, can you make up a situation where in recombination may be disadvantageous? Now in the, in the, in the lecture slide, it talked about putting together you know, let's say this individual has a good mutation but a bad one, and that individual has a good mutation but a bad one. You can get an offspring that has the two good ones. So, when might it be bad? You had your hand up? I was also going to say in small populations, it would be very disadvantageous um, to try and get two individuals together. That's a possibility. Yeah, so if you have a small population, you can have an inbreeding effect. Yeah, yeah. So that would be one, so this is actually, you're exactly right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that example, but I'm going to also use exactly the opposite too. So the one, point, one person pointed out here that imagine you have two bad mutations, this has got a bad one, this has got a bad one, but they're on different places. You can theoretically get an offspring that has both bad ones, so they're extra bad. That's one piece. The other thing, which is basically the converse of that same idea, is imagine that you have a chromosome that has two good mutations, and it breeds with somebody that has neither of those you can actually produce somebody who only has one of those good mutations. In fact, it's very likely you will produce somebody that only has one. So recombination isn't just absolutely always a good thing. It sometimes screws up something that's well made. But if you could actually, if you could strategize recombination, what you do is you'd have recombination exist anytime you have like, you know, combinations of bad mutations. But once you have the perfect genotype, it stops. Unfortunately, nature doesn't do that. <laughs> nature just keeps on having recombination out there. So there's a lot of theories out there. These are, as you know, these are more conceptual questions than what we've had in the past. These aren't just problem-oriented. But there's a lot of theories out there about, like, what's an optimal rate of recombination in a population? Right? Because too much can actually be bad, because every time you have a good genotype, it's broken up in the next generation. Right? So it, it's a little tricky in this regard. You'll see this, actually, as we go into more and more of the class now, that things are not going to be as clear-cut and formulaic. There's a lot more of these, you know, forces that are in opposition, things like that. Problem number three, calculate pi for the following sequences. I'll just do this real quick for you guys. So again, what you do is you compare each possible pairwise thing. So looking at it, there are three pairwise combinations. Between the first and second, we have two differences in nucleotides. Second and third, we have two differences. First and third, we have, I think, zero. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we add these up, two plus two plus zero. Okay. Divide that by the total number of comparisons. In this case, it's 3. So this comes out to 1.33. That's pi. Now, as I said, you should do pi per site. So you divide that by the total number of sites. There are 10 bases here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So your pi per site is 0.133. Okay? Anybody have any questions on calculating pi? You guys in lab were actually getting pi uh, specifically for synonymous sites, but luckily you didn't actually have to go there and do it manually. That would have been horrible. <laughs> it was nice that the software just spat it out for you. But again, this is just a measure of the average pairwise difference. What this is saying is that for this set of humans in this sequence, on average, a random selected pair differ at 13% of their nucleotides. That's putting it into words. That on average, a randomly selected pair differ at 13%. Okay? 
Number four, so for the previous one, and just to remind you, the pi that we just calculated is 0.13. Uh, if there's a site nearby, there's, I think it said like 2,000 some bases, uh, there's no hot spots between it, what is the effect of, of pi? What's the effect on pi? So let's take a look at the poll, see what you guys voted. Oh, that's the test thing. Let's see, pi. So the vast majority say near zero, a couple say near one, or 0.1, and then nobody says near 0.2 or 1. So the majority are correct. So the critical piece here is if there's a site that's nearby that's swept, right? If there's no recombination between that site and this stretch that, that we're looking at, which was in the previous slide, then what we're going to get is we're going we're to recover uh, basically no variation. That pi should be basically equal to 0. Because again, as you have a sweep, those nearby sites that fail to recombine lose all variation. They've experienced a selective sweep. Now, what if we had something further, further afield? So this is, again, going to that one where it was 0 0.13 previously. Let's say a mutation arose at a site that was not totally linked. Let's say it was, you know, some distance away. What might you expect pi to be in the sequences after this new mutation swept now? Don't expect, I mean, I'm not expecting an exact number, but just, you know, what do you ballpark think it might be? Would it be zero? No, it would not be zero. Probably what you'd expect is it would be somewhere below 0.13, but above zero. So you'd say something like zero less than pi less than 0 0.13. Now, what, you know, it's hard to look at this and say, well, how much exactly do you lose from 0.1 centimorgan? In fact, just so you know, in fact, if, even though that's a very, very low amount of recombination, you probably lose almost no pi. It would probably, probably end up being like 0.12 or 0.11. That, you know, just a little tiny bit of recombination actually makes it so that it's, it's almost completely dissociated. Unless, unless the sweep was like insanely strong or something like that. But really all you can say for sure is this piece right here. Yeah. Problem number six. Imagine this set of sequences. So we have in this case a red G base. And that red G base is, uh, is slightly bad. Notice I made sure it was slightly bad. It reduces fitness by 0.001. We have a blue C base there on the same sequence. It's advantageous. It increases fitness by 0.02 when homozygous. Let's say it arose, this good mutation arose on a chromosome that had the bad mutation. Again, since the bad mutations are so common, this is going to happen. It's not like you know, good mutations choose the best chromosome. They're going to rise on things that also have bad chromosomes. What's going to happen? Assuming there's no recombination anywhere in this stretch, what's going to happen in future generations? What do we expect the later generations uh, sequence to be? Anybody volunteer? Exactly. Basically, in the end, everybody will have this sequence. Now, why did I emphasize this? This basically shows how it's possible for bad mutations to hitchhike alongside a good one. Right? This shows how it's possible for bad mutations, not just neutral ones, but bad mutations can even hitchhike alongside a good one. Now, they have to be not as, not as they can't be so bad that they outweigh the benefit of the good one then obviously then it wouldn't spread, it would get eliminated. But this is the kind of thing that happens a lot, and people have seen evidence for this in the human genome, that they see that as this you know, beneficial mutation has arisen, this disease has come along with it, but it just happens the disease isn't as bad as the benefit is from the good mutation to which it's linked. So it's kind of a funny thing that happens there. This actually comes up a lot in the context of domestication, that when we have these domesticated animals, we're, we're putting very strong selection on, and we're picking particular traits, but then these bad things are hitchhiking along with it. It's not just inbreeding, but it's actually the hitchhiking associated with it. Question seven. A lot of people were asking about this as I was walking around. You find five broad areas with very low pi. So the pi here in this case is near zero. They're labeled A, B, C, D, and E. So they're exactly at these pinpointed spots. If you're trying to pinpoint the location of a selective sweep and find the actual mutation that swept, right? That you want, like basically, so you want the smallest possible window to have swept. Which of these five areas would be most likely to find the adaptive mutation? A through E. What's the answer? Somebody just yell it out. E. The correct answer is E. The reason for this is because, again, in regions of high recombination, right, you have much smaller sweeps. So at that point, then you can pinpoint where the adaptive mutation was. Let me exit out of this for one second. I want to bring back a slide I showed earlier. It's like the example from the beginning of class, this one. It's like in this case. If you wanted to pinpoint, let's say, for example, you didn't know where this red site was that's, that's drawn on here, right? In the region of low recombination, you've eliminated all variation along this long set. 
And so you should have higher recombination, you've eliminated a smaller set. So let's say, for example, you didn't know which one was the red one there. You just knew that there's this absence of variation here. Here you wouldn't be able to narrow down where the adaptive mutation was in that whole stretch. In this one over here, though, you'd be able to narrow it down to a smaller area. So that's the critical piece, that in regions of higher recombination, you have less, uh, you have smaller sweeps, less hitchhiking, and therefore you can pinpoint good mutations much better. Okay? Let me zoom back over to that. The last question, if beneficial new mutations and frequent bad new mutations were equally frequent, which, is, which would have a greater effect on variation in natural populations, selective sweeps or background selection? So imagine that 50% of mutations are good, 50% of mutations are bad. Which of those would have a bigger effect? 50-50 shot, if you guess. <laughs> background selection? Anybody have another idea? I'll give you a hint, you should pick another one. <laughs> Correct answer is sweeps. The reason for that is because, and this is the thing I was alluding to at the very beginning of lecture today, when you have background selection, if you have bad mutation, you just eliminate variation on the one chromosome, right? With a sweep, you actually eliminate variation along a, along a huge swath of the genome, right? Because what ends up happening is that you basically eliminate every single individual's variation at that site. Background selection, you only eliminate one individual's variation at the site. The only reason background selection works so well is because there's so many more bad mutations than good mutations. But if they were equally frequent, as the example says here, then sweeps would have a much bigger effect than background selection. Because again, every individual loses variation, not just one individual losing variation. Okay? So a couple of things I wanted to go into just building from this. Now sweeps, again, eliminate variation in specific regions of the genome, right? in everybody. And you have this drop in pi. And you can measure this drop in pi in a bunch of different ways. The way you guys mentioned or measured it in lab is using synonymous sites. So you're just looking at ones that actually encode for the same amino acids. So you're only looking at pi at every third base. And that gives you a better idea of sort of neutral, neutral variation. But even if you looked at non-synonymous variation, this is actually a picture from the human genome too. Even if you look at non-synonymous variation, if you look around the selected site, you still see this drop in variation. So the sweeps are pretty strong no matter how you measure pi. And the effect is the same. Now, this is very heavily used. People do this, what they refer to as hitchhiking mapping now. And you can use this drop in pi in the region of genome to pinpoint where the adaptive sweep was, especially if it's in a region of high recombination. This is a picture from uh, Plasmodium. Uh, in, the, in the study that's, that's presented here, it was actually, um, Plasmodium was exposed to this anti-malarial drug of, uh, however you say that, pyrimethamine. And what ended up happening is it adapted to it. So what they did is they said, well, let's sequence the genomes of all these plasmodium and see, like, what caused it to adapt. And sure enough, right in the middle, you see this, like, fairly high measures of pi, very low pi right here. And this happens to be a gene which confers resistance. So you, you can actually pinpoint what, gen, what genetic change actually caused it by using this sort of measurement of variation across the genome and say, hey, that must be something that was important. And sure enough, in this case, this was sort of a good example because you actually knew what the selective force was and what the genes functions were. So that's pretty cool. Now, surprisingly, there's not been many uh, examples of selective sweeps in recent human history. Now, if you go, if you compare humans to chimps, sure, you see a lot of evidence for sweeps. But actually, there was a 2011 study that looked at 179 human genome sequences. And although they found a couple of cases where there may have been a couple of sweeps there, by and large, they said that classic sweeps were not a dominant mode of human adaptation over the past 250,000 years. We haven't had very many of them. It's kind of surprising. You would have thought there would be a lot. Now, what you do see is you do see, of course, these selected allele frequency differences among populations. If you look at, you know, say, comparing Europeans with, uh, with Africans or with Asian populations, you do see allele frequency differences, but you don't see the sweep across the entire human species almost at all. There's also, of course, some signal of background selection. Now, the big question I want you guys to think about a little bit, and we've been assuming in everything we've been doing that these synonymous changes are really neutral. Now, I want you to continue to assume that, but I want to give you a little bit of the dose of reality out there. Now, we use this again in the McDonald Cry we use it in DNDS, and it's used again to scale for mutation rate. It's sometimes used in the examinations of pi. It does the same amino acid, but in fact, there are reasons that synonymous changes may be non-neutral. And there's actually, in fact, some evidence that some of them are non-neutral. That, you know, one reason it might happen is because the transcription rate of different codons may be affected by different tRNA abundances. Imagine there's, imagine like there's four codons for valine, you know, GUA, GUC, GUU, GU, G. And let's say for a particular gene, you need to produce a ton of valine. But let's say the tRNA for GUG is way more abundant than the others. 
You can produce it a lot faster if you have a GUG than if you have a GUU. Right? Even though it's the same amino acid in the end. So there can be reasons why it's actually important to have a particular synonymous codon. The other thing is, too, there can be some aspects of the code that affect either the messenger RNA secondary structure or affect whether or not an intron is spliced properly. So these are some things that come in there. Now, the question is, is there evidence that these are true? In fact, the, there is very strong evidence that that's true. So here's the example of valine I was just telling you out loud. If you look in the human genome, this is the abundance of valine codons. 46%. These are not a quarter, 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 which is what you'd expect if it was just random, right? But you see a ton of this GUG and way less of GUA or GUU. Now, typically speaking, you do tend to see stronger codon bias both in microorganisms or any small organisms in general and in highly expressed genes. This highly expressed genes part is consistent with that tRNA hypothesis I just tossed out to you. And generally speaking, not in every species, but generally speaking, it's the G or C ending codons that are generally the most abundant. So this suggests maybe these, you know, these synonymous changes aren't necessarily as neutral as our tests assume. However, of course, as with everything, there's some debate. <laughs> this, this could be neutral, or it could be selected. So there could be selection for particular codons, which is the, the pitch I've just been giving you. There could be selection unrelated to the codon itself, but having something to do with the structure. Now, this is the other part. There could be biases in mutation rate. Maybe that you, know, you get way more mutations from U to G than the other way, and that's why you see more of the GUG codons than the others. There's also something called uh, biased gene conversion, that if you have a heteroduplex DNA and you have a G on one and a, and a U on the other, it tends to repair itself preferentially for the G, which is almost like a mutational bias in some level. So maybe <laughs> it could be all of these things to varying degrees. But again, this is yet another ongoing debate in the really hot area of molecular evolution where, where it seems like there's a lot of debates. <laughs> The important thing for all these things is nobody's ever saying that these processes are not happening. Nobody ever says background selection doesn't happen. Nobody ever says sweeps don't happen. Nobody says all codon bias is, is selective or neutral. But it's just how much is it this versus that. So uh, without further ado, if you have any questions, come on up to the front, and we'll do a Friday review uh, as, as per usual. Thank you all. <laughs>